Hi, my name is Dr. Jay Schwartz and I'm a chiropractic neurologist and uh, this video is about the U.S. United States recovery to uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus and the steps that we can take each and every one of us in order to prevent the infection or prevent each individual from getting infected. As of April 29th, 2020, uh, these are the statistics, total number of cases in the United States, over a million, just over a million, total deaths, 57,000. Percentage-wise, not terrible, but that's still 57,505 too many people have died as a result or indirectly as a result of this virus. Uh, deaths in Florida, 1,206 just as a comparison to New York, which has had how many thousands, tens of thousands. The signs and symptoms of COVID-19 uh, present at illness. Uh, they vary as far as the symptoms go, but pretty much what we found is that fever is in about 83 to 99 percent of the cases. So that's why it's a great idea that anywhere you go for your fever to be taken. Uh, we take the fever on all of our patients who enter the office. Coughing, 59 to 82 percent. Fatigue, 44 to 70 percent. Anorexia, you know, lack of eating, uh, 40 to 84 percent. Shortness of breath, that's, we always thought that was a big one. Well, it's 31 to 40 percent. Uh, sputum production, 28 to 33 percent. And myalgias, which is pain in the muscles, at 11 to 35 percent. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the symptoms overlap with the typical flu. Uh, atypical pre presentations have been described in older adults and persons with medical comorbidities. That's a, a very popular word these days. Comorbidities meaning underlying factors, underlying diseases. May have delayed presentation of fever and respiratory symptoms. And in one study of a thousand cases, fever was present in only 44 percent in hospital admission, but later on developed in 89 percent during hospitalization. The rates of hospitalization for COVID-19 increased with age, not surprisingly. The very young, 18 to 49, two and a half, 7.4, as we get older, up to uh, greater than 85, 17% uh, of the cases are over 85 years of age. So obviously the older we get, the sicker we are, the immune system does not function as well, plus the fact that there's a greater chance for comorbidities. Preliminary uh, CDD statistics in patients in ICU, 32% of patients in ICU, which is moderate or to severe cases, okay, primarily severe cases, 32% of them have diabetes. Obesity considered an unknown factor. They didn't determine exactly what the percentage is. 29% cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease being hypertension, peripheral artery disease, congestive, congestive heart failure. 21% chronic pulmonary diseases, COPD, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, emphysema, asthma, all caused by smoking. 9% immunocompromised uh, diseases, cancer, where your immune system is suppressed and therefore is not functioning as well as it should. Pre-existing conditions, cardiovascular disease, the death rate confirmed cases, 13.2%, diabetes, 9.2%, chronic respiratory disease, 8%, hypertension, 8.4%, and immunosuppressant diseases such as cancer, 7.6%. And then in all cases, the, here are the percentages as well. My whole point in showing these slides and these statistics is to show you that most people, the overwhelming majority of people who get moderate to severe cases, including those who die, uh, have uh, underlying diseases, comorbidities. 80% of total COVID-19s have mild disease, 10 to 16% have moderate to severe disease, 3 to 4% at this point result in death. Uh, these are estimates, 10 to 20% have comorbidities, okay? So what we're basically saying is that out of the 20%, which are the moderate to severe cases, 10 to 20% of them have 
comorbidities. Obvious fact, the majority of moderate to severe cases had comorbidities. That's the obvious fact that you can get from all these statistics. The obvious question, is it the coronavirus that kills or is it the comorbidities that kill or suppress the body's immune system so that it can handle COVID-19? That's a key question here. So, now on to the things that you can do in order to reclaim your life and make your body stronger so that if we do have this pandemic again, right, if there's a recurrence, if there's a second wave, whatever the case may be, we want people to be able to handle it. So I want to teach you how do you attain and maintain the ultimate state of health, because really, what is health? The health is the body functioning right. Okay? Everyone needs guidance. If you're not a patient, you'll want to become a patient so that you can receive the appropriate guidance on your journey to health. So what we're going to learn today, what is health? What is truly health? Why do people get sick? Can we control our own health destiny? Do medications cure disease? A lot of people think they do. Can we prevent disease? Heart disease, cancer, diabetes. How can we live healthy, disease-free lives? The, what I call the five plus factors. So what is health? Is health feeling good or is it 100% function or a combination of both? Most people, you ask them on the street, what is health? And they will tell you, oh, feeling good. A sense of well-being. Okay, those are common answers. Okay, the main answer is 100% function. If the body is functioning right, you're going to be healthy. That's really the key. That's what determines whether you're going to be healthy. There are people that have heart attacks, feeling great. All their blood work is terrific. And then suddenly they have a heart attack. Very often, days after they see the cardiologist and are given a clean bill of health, they have a heart attack. How does that happen? How, does, how do you get cancer? Feeling great, they do a chest x-ray for whatever the case may be, a new job and find out that you have cancer. High blood pressure, again, feeling great. I can't begin to tell you how many patients come into my office. We take their blood pressure. They have no symptoms whatsoever related to blood pressure, and yet they have high blood pressure. Okay, so these are things that people need to be aware of that they can have when they're feeling good, and therefore, they believe that they're healthy. Well, let me tell you something. If you have a heart attack, you ain't healthy. If you have cancer, you're certainly not healthy. And high blood pressure, again, you're, I'm healthy, but I have high blood pressure. What does that mean? Okay, there's something causing the high blood pressure. Your body's not working right. Gray's Anatomy, which is, the, uh, this, which is the book when it comes to, the benchmark when it comes to anatomy books, not the TV show. It describes health as being the ability of the body to adapt to internal and external stress. That's my favorite definition. The ability of body to, to adapt to internal stress as well as external stress. Relating that to COVID-19, real simple. COVID-19 overwhelmed the body. The body's immune system was not able to deal with it, and that's why the person got a severe case and possibly may have died. Darwin's Medical Dictionary, a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. In other words, what Dorland's is saying, if you're not sick, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're healthy. This just interesting article I found in, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, I still read the New York papers. Um, U.S. hospitals set a record for how quickly they open blocked arteries. More than 93% of the patients now have their arteries cleared within the recommended 90 minutes, and they're bragging about it. Well, that's great, but why reach a point where you need a stent, where you need to have your arteries open? So why do people get sick? Organ systems are weak, the body becomes toxic, malfunction develops. These, this is the main reason why people get sick, okay? The first thing is you have to have 100% nerve function. I'm a chiropractic neurologist. I deal with the nervous system, the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerves, which are like wires that go out to each and every part of the body. 
There are 11 systems in the body and they must be all under the control of the master system which is the nervous system. And therefore the nervous system has to be functioning at 100%. Well, one of the common problems that develop, and people don't even realize it because it really is a silent killer, and that's a subluxation. A subluxation is when a, a, a spinal vertebra moves out of place, becomes locked or, or fixed in a misaligned position, and it presses on a nerve, and I don't know why these slides are moving by themselves. But they press on the nerve. This is a side view of the spine. The person's moving, uh, looking to your left. The first bone, the third, and the fourth are in their proper alignment, but the second, the second one is out of place. This is a thick, healthy nerve. This is a thick, healthy nerve. But look at this nerve. This nerve is atrophied. It's deteriorated because of the fact that this bone has been out of place putting pressure on it. But what it also does is look at, let's look at the discs, which I'm also a specialist in, okay, in discopathies. We have a normal disc here, a normal disc down here, but look how degenerated that disc is because the bone is put is pulled out of, is moved, has moved out of place and has been tugging or pulling on the discs and it's caused degeneration of the discs. Subluxations affect the autonomic nervous system. What's the autonomic nervous system? Well, it's part of the main nervous system. And what the autonomic nervous system is, is that portion of the nervous system that supplies your organs. All of your organs, the heart, lungs, kidney, spleen, your vital organs, your blood vessels, it controls the size of your blood vessels, which determines how much blood gets to an area of the body, including the spine, the spinal cord, and the brain as well. So that's the importance of the autonomic nervous system. If it's not functioning right, you can develop organic problems, systemic problems, okay, not just musculoskeletal, the typical back and neck pain. Disease. So what happens is when subluxations develop, it, it causes, they cause pain very often, but they don't have to cause pain all the time. Okay, you could be asymptomatic, sort of like those COVID-19 patients who are asymptomatic. But because of the fact that subluxations can cause dis-ease, dis-ease is a lack of harmony, is a lack of function within the body, malfunction. And then what happens is that will progress where then it will be bad enough that you start developing symptoms. So disease results in disease. Subluxations can cause pain, tingling, numbness, dyspathology, asthma, allergies, digestive problems, reproductive and urinary problems, or it doesn't have to cause any symptoms whatsoever. Okay, That's why when subluxations first develop, we want to find them. We want to get to them in the, in the in the stage, in the infantile stage, in the toddler stage, when, when we are children, in order to determine if they have subluxations, if they do, let's correct them then before they become more serious later on in life. So subluxations, I call a silent killer. The spine is the most neglected aspect of a person's health. Okay, We're taught in a kindergarten or pre-kindergarten Here's a toothbrush. This is why you have to brush your teeth. Here's the best way to do it in order to prevent tooth decay. It's the same thing here. We need to learn to take care of our spines by eliminating subluxations and then take pressure off of our spines by doing things properly so that we don't develop spinal decay. And how do we correct them? By a, by a chiropractic adjustment, by taking my hands, I place them on a person's spine, I know where the bones are out of place, and then I gently push them back into place. It's a harmless uh, procedure, okay, if it's done correctly. Superior nutrition, very, very important. Over the past 30 years, hypertension rates skyrocketed. Cancer rates have skyrocketed. Diabetes skyrocketed, as you can see, 32% of the COVID-19 patients have, uh, in ICU have diabetes. Childhood obesity, okay, skyrocketed. 66% of adults are obese. 33% of children are obese. Number of fast food restaurants have more than doubled, 131 billion in revenues based on the National Restaurant Association. 66% of adults are overweight, 31%, I think I said 33%, 31% of all children are overweight. That's horrible, 31% are overweight. I mean, they, they don't have a chance 
before they even reach teenage years. 33% have at least one fast food meal every single day. That's got to stop. We have to stop with the, fun, with the junk foods. We have to stop with the fast foods. This is why we have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease. Okay? A major reason. If we ate better, we'd be able to handle COVID-19. People are not eating the right foods. Junk food is the primary food a lot of people eat. So there is, there is uh, the question of high fat versus low fat, high, carbohydrate, high car carbohydrate versus low carbohydrate, high protein versus low protein. What I will tell you now is that you should be eating a low fat diet, low carbohydrate, and moderate amount of protein. This is the ideal type of dietary regimen that you should be on. Acid, alkaline, or base balance is very delicate. The blood should be a little bit on the basic side. Seven is neutral. One is very acidic. Fourteen is very basic. It should be at about 7.36 to 7.45. Okay, if it goes down to 7.3, that's considered acidic as far as the blood is concerned. If it goes... Um, if it goes below 7.31, is acidic, but we want it at minimum 7.36, which means that we have to eat alkaline foods. Greens are alkaline foods. Vegetables um, and, and a lot of fruit are alkaline, so you want to think green. Acid di disrupts the balance, okay, the acid-base balance. Acid weakens red blood cells. We need red blood cells in order to carry oxygen to our cells in the body. Red blood cells die and release more acid, which is which kind of mushrooms or snowballs the effect. Body tries to compensate with alkaline reserves, so it starts utilizing its alkaline reserves, and then acids start to uh, alkaline uh, um, reserves become depleted. The acid starts to burn through the blood vessels, and the body compensates by lining the walls with cholesterol. So it's a it's a long term overall process that needs to be rectified. Alkalizing breaks the cycles, cycle of excessive amounts of acid. How do you get out of balance? One of the things, negative emotions have a tremendous acidic impact on the body. The body releases more acids. Polluted environment makes you more acidic. Okay, That's something that's difficult to control, but we can't control the, um, the pollution in our houses and in our offices. Acid diet, animal proteins, cooked oils, sugar, and refined carbohydrates. It's got to stop, or at least be limited. Cells give off acid. The new environment becomes a breeding ground now for bacteria, yeast, and fungus, virus, and molds. A lot of them like an acidic environment. Okay, you develop disease. The truth is it's an acid problem that begins with the disturbance of your environment due to the foods that you eat in the air that you breathe. So it all goes back to the food, especially. Subluxations and nerve irritation simultaneously develop because of the fact that you develop toxins in your body. It has an effect on your muscles, and the muscles pull the bones out of place. Three-step cycle of regaining balance. You want to cleanse your system ideally for 7 to 10 days. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to fast, okay? but a good, just a, a fruit diet or your juice for 7 to 10 days, and that will help to clean you out. Interrupt the destructive patterns. Stop indulging in negative emotions and eating acidic foods. I know it's easier said than done, but we have to start doing that. Provide your body with core nutri nutrients. Water, drink 50% of your body weight. What I like to do is recommend all of my patients 100 ounces of water a day. I know it sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. 100 ounces of water, let's say you're up 8 to 10 hours a day, so let's use 8. 8 times 12 is 96. It's like drinking a can of soda each hour. It's not that terrible. Oxygen. Yes, we do need oxygen. Very important. Oxygen is converted to energy through the Krebs cycle. Vitamins and minerals. Vitamins and minerals help reactions to occur, chemical reactions, and therefore we need them. Fresh alkaline foods, Okay, as I discussed before. Weight loss. Dieting doesn't work. I'm not going to get into a whole uh, video, which I have a separate video on weight loss and what I recommend, but dieting doesn't work because where there's a start, there is an end. Health must be the goal. There, there has to be a burning desire, a burning desire to be healthy. 
That's what the goal is, not just to lose weight, because if the burning desire is to lose weight, you lose the weight, then what happens? You put it back on again. Start looking at people in the food courts. See what's out there. That's not what you want to be. Proper exercise every day. Aerobic exercise, anaerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise, exercise the heart and the lungs. Anaerobic exercises the muscles. You need both in order to be healthy. Find an exercise you enjoy. I run seven days a week. I've been running for 40 something years. All right? Every morning, right after I brush my teeth, I go out and I run. I don't miss it. Not a day. Okay, and the reason for that is because I have a burning desire to be healthy. And I know that if I don't exercise, then it's going to lead to sickness and disease. There's a direct correlation. Same thing with the foods that I eat as well. So you find an exercise you enjoy, so you have a burning desire, whether it's biking. By the way, I run seven days a week. I bike four days a week, a minimum of 10 miles each time. And I work out four days a week, or five days a week. Seven, four, and five. Okay? I do this because health is important to me. Perform it every day, preferably in the morning because you're too tired at night. It's like brushing your teeth. You won't leave your house without brushing your teeth, hopefully. Well, same thing here. You don't leave your house without exercising. It gives you a high for the rest of the day, and I could speak personally about that because it definitely does. It burns calories, excretes toxins, and reduces acids. Exercise lower diabetes risk, but obese patients benefited significantly only by exercising at least five times weekly. I stress this because the government used to say three days a week. Now they change it to five days a week. Well, it turns out that what they said was when, it, when they recommended three days a week, it was only for one reason, because they didn't think that people would, rec would exercise every day. So they increased it to five. It should be every day. That's based on American Journal of Medicine in uh, 2009. Sleep is a maximum state of physiological rest. Rest is so important. You have to get proper amounts of rest. Why do you need proper amounts of rest? Because the body rehabilitates itself. I am fighting this thing like crazy. Or I should say it's fighting me. How did we get so far ahead? Okay, sleep, maximum state of physiological rest. You spend about a third of your life in bed, hopefully about eight hours, and therefore um, you want to give your body a chance to rehabilitate and replenish itself. Good pillow supports your head and neck. Good pillow is cervical pillow, cervical as in your neck. Uh, gives your body a chance to rehabilitate itself, as I said. Positive emotions, anything in life you think you want, you only want because of the feeling you believe obtaining it will give you. Okay, it's based on your emotions. Our lives are defined by the emotions we feel on a daily basis. So therefore, in order to change your emotion, change your feeling. Emotions are signals calling us to action. We could change our emotions instantly. Okay, you really can. Okay, because emotions are based on feelings. So the six steps to mastering, I'm having a good time here. Emotions and feelings can be changed from moment to moment depending on what you believe is true. Identify the true emotion you're feeling. Sometimes you don't understand the emotion. You don't understand why you feel the way you feel. So understand the, the true emotion you're feeling. Do I need to change my perception? Maybe somebody did something and you're perceiving it wrong, or you're not communicating well enough, or that person's not communicating well enough, okay? Or do you have to change your overall behavior? That's what you need to determine. How do I want to feel, and what do I have to do and believe in order to feel that way now? How do I want to feel? So you determine, how do I want to feel, and what do I need to do? How do I need to change in order to have that feeling at this very moment. What can I learn from the experience? So that this way it doesn't happen again in the future. And get confident. I've handled things like this before. That's what you always have to think about. Similar instances. Or it doesn't even have to be that similar. You could still relate one instance to another. You could say, gee, I handled it then. If I can handle it then, I can handle it now. Everything we do and don't do 
is based on a pain versus pleasure principle. And this is a little bit complex, and we could talk about it on your visits if you want. We have two fundamental drives. We want to avoid pain. That's the strongest drive we have, to avoid pain. Nobody likes pain, and we want to gain pleasure. That's secondary, but it's still a strong emotion as well. Okay, so we will do far more to avoid pain than we will to gain pleasure. Knowing that, let's utilize that theory, okay, which supposedly is fact, let's utilize that to our benefit. If you keep procrastinating, eventually the pain of not doing it will become greater than the pleasure and benefit of avoiding it. So let's say you want to lose weight, you want to become healthy, but I really don't want to give up, 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 the, up the foods that I want to eat. I want to eat the pizza, I want to eat the McDonald's, I want to eat the Burger King. So therefore, I'm going to keep procrastinating because I want to avoid the pain of not eating those foods. Whereas what you should do is you should look at it the opposite way. If I don't stop eating these things, there's going to be a heck of a lot of pain later on in life because I'm going to get certain diseases that I don't want to get. So therefore, it makes more sense to give this up now so I can avoid the pain later on. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So if you want to change your behavior, you must function your, focus your attention on how not changing your behavior, in other words, staying the way you are, will be more painful than changing it. Okay? How changing it will bring you great pleasure. So now you think about, okay, when I lose that weight and I get in better shape and I'm healthy, I'm going to be able to get involved with sports that I've always wanted to get involved with. I w I'm going to be able to do things. I'm going to be able to climb mountains. I'm going to be able to ride a bike. I'm going to be able to play with my kids or my grandchildren. I'm going to be able to do things that I couldn't do before. So again, you want to avoid pain. Do Think about what you have to do in order to avoid pain and gain pleasure. If you magnify it in your mind, this process becomes a lot easier. You think that by doing something, you'll gain more pleasure, but at the same time, you think it may mean more pain, so you sabotage it. Four emotions with any decision. The pleasure of doing it, pain if I do it, the pleasure of not doing it, and the pain if I don't do it. This is what you have to evaluate. So you must change the neuro associations in order to change the behavior. So I'll give you a personal example. Hot dogs and cold cuts. I'm Jewish. I had a Jewish mother. My mom, that's what she used to feed us, hot dogs. Once, at least once a week we'd have hot dogs, cold cuts, pastrami, corned beef, New York pastrami, Carnegie Deli. Are you kidding me? Okay? Delicious. I love that stuff. Except what I did was I realized I have to stop eating it. And the way in which I stopped eating it was I took the pleasure and I converted it into pain. I went online and I took a picture of a test tube of blood with a high fat content. And you see this yellow fat taking up half the test tube that's in your blood. And then you look at how that fat is going to turn into what? Calcific plaque in your arteries and it makes your arteries less flexible, therefore increasing the chances of stroke tremendously or dramatically. So therefore, the pain later on of not changing becomes greater than the 30 seconds of pleasure that you get from eating that hot dog or pastrami or Oreos that I love that I don't eat. So not eating vegetables and fruit erodes my health every day. That's the way I program my mind. Change your beliefs and you'll change the pattern of behavior. Eliminate chemicals. Air. Use air filters at home and work. Water. Drink bottled water. Don't reuse plastic bottles. And the bottled water should be distilled water. That's what we have here. Reverse osmosis is the best home system to use for that cleans, that cleans and filters the water. 
Uh, environmental, use less harsh cleaners. Try vinegar, mixing vinegar with water as a cleaner, rather than all the chemicals that we're using. And of course, now we're using all the chemicals uh, in order to avoid COVID-19. Painkillers only mask the pain. Antibiotics, overuse of antibiotics result in super germs. Also, all these chemical cleaners, we're killing all the germs, we're killing a lot of the, the, a lot of the good germs. Plus, the good germs kill the bad germs. And if we're eliminating the good germs, the bad germs will survive. So we're really setting ourselves up for, for super germs. Okay, Streptococcus A from 20 years ago, which is the skin-eating uh, uh, bacteria. Antibiotics are useless for viruses or fungi, yet you get a cold, a bad cold, or, what they, or a viral bronchitis, and what do they do? They give you antibiotics. That's crazy. Disturbs normal bacteria flora, okay, you need that. Reduces immune system function and causes secondary infections. You'll notice if you take an antibiotic, usually within two weeks, you're going to get sick again. Okay, because it suppresses your immune system function. Germs cause disease? Yes, they do cause disease, but only in the presence of an unhealthy immune system. Let's go back to COVID-19. Okay, all those people who got severe cases and or died had comorbidities, which suppressed their immune system. So germs only cause the disease in the presence of an unhealthy immune system. Six steps to take action and continue. Get disturbed. Stop softening things. Stop saying, oh, it's nothing. It's no big deal. I could change. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next month. I'll do it next year. Get disturbed. Get angry with yourself, okay, so that you'll make these changes. Exaggerate them and make them worse. Emphasize the pain. I don't want to take it any longer. I'm mad as hell and I don't want to take it any longer to quote ne the, uh, that great movie, Network. What are you missing by not taking the action? Okay, not taking the action, procrastinating. What am I missing? I'm missing good health. Results and purpose. What do you want and why do you want it? Okay, what, what do you want? Write it down. What do you want and why do you want to get that way? And it will motivate you even more. Take massive action. Make a list of all the things you need to do, whether it's exercising, as far as exercising, being specific, the type of exercise, what time of day you're going to do it, hopefully in the morning. Beliefs. Change your beliefs because they control your behavior. Make the decision you want to change. Get disturbed. Decide what you're going to, uh, to change and why. Make a list of the pleasure you'll derive from changing the, be the behavior or the pattern. And make a list of the pain you'll feel if you don't change. Change your, this is called changing your neuro.